Right, we're up and running. Back here, part three with uh, Kurt Nickel. Uh, Kurt, what do you believe needs to be done from the grassroots level up to give Great Britain the best chance of securing another world championship? And do you keep up with the British championship results in general still? Um, honestly, I don't keep up with it as okay. well as I do the world championships. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, most of the names now, you know, I, I've kind of lost touch a little bit. Obviously, yeah. I worked with Tommy Searle um, while he was over here in America, and I know Tommy really well. Um, a lot of the other names I don't know as well. Yeah. Uh, from the grassroots up, it's um, it probably needs a special talent because that's what I feel happened through uh, the 80s. I mean, you had, um, you know, Graham Noyce and Neil Hudson, yes, in the 70s. Mm. But when Dave Thorpe came around, yeah. he raised the level um, of the rest of us. And then we had like this sort of raising of the levels that, um, that happens when you get one special talent. And I don't know whether you know you just kind of need that person yeah because uh, I, I don't know if the system is how it is i mean i see i, I think it's a shame and i wish that we had a someone racing the world championship because i keep up a lot with the world championship It'd be great to see a british fighter at the front yeah uh, you know it, it's some of them are getting better like that uh watson you know he, mm -hmm. getting closer to the front in mx2 yeah uh, but, you know, probably we're going to just have to get that special talent that will bring everyone else up um, sometime and might happen more by luck than anything else. I mean, the French, I mean, they had a very good system through the 90s and 2000s where, you know, they took kids and actually had motocross schools and they, uh, I know Jackie Bimond was very involved in it and Yannick Bella and a few others. And I still see Yannick out here with young riders now. Um, so, and that was run by the Federation. So, I mean, it potentially, it, it would be a long-term aim to do that. But yeah. if the ACU set something like that up, where they actually funded the riders to spend more time riding, then, you know, that might help bring things forward. Here I see, every day I see the same kids out on the track. And, I mean, they're riding like professionals when they're very, very young. Mm which leads to short careers. People like Filippoto and Dungey and Carmichael and these guys, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're racing so much and riding so much from a young age that yeah. they tend to burn out. Mm. Uh, but it does, they are very, very fast. And yeah. I, I don't know, we just don't sort of have that system in England uh, mm. that allows that. So... You wouldn't get instant results if you did that, but if the ACU implemented some kind of elite motocross system now, mm. you'd probably get results in five, six years' time. Yeah. Um, did I'm not sure if this is that was true or not. Did you used to live uh, in France at one point? I did. Yeah, yeah. I lived there several years, and my oh, family still has uh, the house which I lived in. Is still in the family now. It's a farmhouse. Okay. And it, that, that actually improved my racing career a lot, although I didn't know how it was going to when we bought it just because we had land. Yeah. And that I could ride on that land and, you know, build things. And uh, that made a massive difference to me. Um, which I, you know, before that, I had to go to tracks and then when I could sort of ride straight out of the workshop straight onto the track and do different things it really helped my riding um but you know that you don't have to there's a lot of kids don't have that opportunity um, yeah. but it, I think if you could take kids and you know get them riding a lot more from a young age their technique would be a lot better when by the time they turn 
Yeah. Um, that next question I got was, are there any British races at the moment, either around world level, British level, that you believe have the potential to go all the way? Sort of touched on that a little bit about. Um, you know, I, all the way to world champion. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I doubt it right mm-hmm. now, to be honest. I, I mean, I, like I say, I'm not going to say that I'm a specialist on young British riders at the moment because I don't see them. But mm-hmm. you know, but um, it's like Watson. I think are very, very good already, but they mm-hmm. probably step too far to expect them to win a world championship but hopefully yeah. um we had some really you know great riders like max anstey and yeah. you know, I know max very well because i work with him here and obviously i know his dad merv and <laughs> you know after he won those both races at motocross to nations which i was at Matley, then i thought he was gonna step up then the year after but then a few injuries and things have held him back and so I think it's obviously he's not going to do world championship now, but I think it's unlikely that guys like that is, is probably missed their chance to be a full champion. So we're going to have to wait for the next generation. Yeah. Have you heard of uh, Conrad Muse in the MX2? Supposed to be sort of one of their. Yeah, I I have, and I've watched him ride, and I think he's very very good. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's from what I see, he's quite inconsistent still. And yeah. so, I mean, there is a possibility that if you, he could put that consistency together, he could become a challenger. Yeah. Um, this year, or probably if they get this year going, it will be very important for him because time passes quickly. Yeah. And I know from personal experience that you're a, you know, 19 and 20 year old, you're an up and coming kid. By the time you're 22, 23, if it hasn't happened, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. I mean, time you know he needs to step up now if he's going to make that last step uh, we got a, a there's a youth rider that's just gone into the pro joel rizzy that quite a few people have mentioned don't know if mm. you know about him i do i've seen him uh, on some videos and stuff yeah and about him um i don't have enough information to yeah. know if he's going to make it all the way to be world champion but there's certainly some people that think he is so it'll be interesting to see him when he moves to the next level yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, my last question I've got was, can you tell us about that amazing day lifting the MX the Nations trophy and everything with Team GB? Yeah, I mean, what an amazing day. It would be uh, great for get three riders that could do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was a collection of circumstances which, uh, you know, just everything clicked together that day and it started from beforehand it was when dave thought was a uh, team manager yeah. and you know david had some new ideas the team manager before that uh you know guys like albert carter and dennis slaughter and these guys absolutely fantastic people mm. um, weren't ex-riders they were from the acu yeah and when they put david in there as team manager you know, David had ideas and he got all the riders together before the race. You know, we all roomed together. We all uh, went practicing together and kind of prepared like that. So it made a team spirit that I'd never seen before at the Motocross to Nations uh, yeah. when it was team manager. And so I think we all came into that day feeling really positive because of that. Um, and you know, then, uh, you know, Paul wasn't riding 125s then. He was riding 250s. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he was riding 250s. And, yeah. you know, he hadn't done very well. He yeah. wasn't that competitive in the 250s. We'd been racing together all year. And and then all of a sudden, you know, one, he got, a you know, a great bike that pumped him up. And two, I think, you know, he proved that he was a better 125 rider after that. And then he was a big bike rider, which no one knew at the time because, you know, uh-huh. he here as 500s when it was first yeah. winning um but it, it just kind of he was the he was the spark because that was the difference because in the motocross nations you need three riders that all ride well on the day and yeah. um that's why america won all the time because they have yeah. such a big talent pool that yeah. they always 
three riders. Every other country had, you know, one top rider, two maybe top riders, but you always had a weak link. Yeah. And on paper, our team looked like it should be that again. You know, Rob could win on his day, definitely. Yeah. Um, I could win on my day. Um, I'd probably be more consistent that you think I probably would get in the top three. Rob might win or he might be 10th. Yeah. And then Paul, I mean, I, I don't think anyone really expected him to, at that time, to be right up the front. And so, mm. just, you know, from race one, when he won the 125 class, yeah. I think immediately, you know, we all knew we were in with a chance. Yeah. Uh, and one thing which, you know, I, looking back, uh, was quite amazing to me is that once we'd done the first two races, which I think Paul won both 125s, I think I was third or second in the 500 and Rob was second or third in the 250. So we had four results that meant that the, all we needed in the last race was a third place in either the 500 or 250 class. And before the gate dropped, I knew I was going to do that. So I actually went to the gate absolutely sure that we were going to win. Like yeah. I had no doubt in my mind that barring, you know, a, some kind of malfunction with the bike that, uh, you know, we were going to win that. And, um, that confidence stayed all the way through. I got to the front of the race and completely controlled it. And it wasn't until right at the end when I got nervous that I slowed up. But <laughs> I remember, was, that, was that when you uh, waved LaRocco through? Yeah, well, that was the first thing. He was there and I was, actually had him completely covered. And yeah. I was in the race nicely. Yeah. Um, and then it was like a switch in my brain, I think, <laughs> with about three laps to go. Um, I just... You know, I could see everybody. They were going completely ballistic. Um, you know, Julian and <laughs> all the guys, Albert Carter, Dennis Slaughter, these guys that have been part of the motocross nations for 15 years yeah. and got anywhere near to it. And I could see their faces. And suddenly I thought, oh, my God, I can't cock this up. <laughs> so the first thing I thought was Morocco is going to try and kill me because that's their only chance. Yeah, yeah. So I waved him by. And then from then on, I was just, I could hear every noise in the bike for those last two or three laps. I thought, oh, no, because it was an old bike as well, an old engine of David's. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this thing's breaking now. And then I thought the clutch was slipping. And the last three laps, I was pathetic. But I had like a 40-second <laughs> lead over third place or something, so I could nurse it up. <laughs> how, did, how, how, what was the, what, how did you actually feel as you went over? Because I remember you going, you were over the line and everyone swamped you. Yeah, no, it was, it, it was amazing. I'm not even sure I finished, went, got to the finish line even now. He <laughs> pulled, pulled me off the bike and lifted me. And, you know, it was nowadays different people win that trophy every year. But, I mean, we were on the back of the Americans winning 13 years in a row right. and, and so used to them winning mm. that to actually finally win it and win it hands down. And actually, you know, the whole team uh, contributed. Mm. Uh, it, was yeah, it was a, a really amazing day mm. uh, not to be repeated no love to see you three guys on a bike together somewhere at some point it would be really cool it'll happen sometime yeah um, hopefully and i think as i mean i still obviously with social media now i see paul and rob still ride every now and again yeah. so i'm sure they can do something i i mean i ride all the time so yeah I'd be pretty confident in beating them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would be confident in you beating them as well. <laughs> uh, but it would yeah. be cool, even if it was just a couple of laps of just going round together. It would be. Yeah, no, I, I bet Farley Motocross Nations, Bet yeah. Motocross Nations would be the place to do it if yeah. the day can ever work out. And mm. hopefully they will one time. But I mean, I understand everyone's busy and. Everyone's got their lives. I mean, I think uh, I'm still obsessed with racing. And yeah. so, you know, I, I do everything I can to go racing all the time. So, But I understand that they're probably not exactly the same. Yeah, still doing plenty of winning. Yeah, I mean, I, I still, you know, I won the uh, over 50 championship again over here. And, um, 
you know, I'm still pretty competitive. I mean, I'm not competitive, obviously, with young guys because really fast young kids are way faster than me. And it's not that I'm super slow, but they are super fast nowadays. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I'm on the right track on the right day. I still feel pretty good on a bike and I really enjoy it. And there's still no feeling like lining up behind the gate. And like we have the sort of biggest local race series here is a very well attended um they pull up um, rem they ride, ride them most saturdays i always ride in the pro class um against all the kids as well and i occasionally i can still pull out a win if no one super fast shows up <laughs> but, uh, does that still I, feel good still feel good race the winning still feels just as good as it yeah, ever did yeah. that's it's uh sometimes you talk to people and you think they think, well, you know, you won world championships. Mm. How can you still feel good to win a local race? Uh, but it still does. It still feels <laughs> good. Are you, still, are you planning on coming? Is is, there st- is it still going to be uh, on Farley this year? Or is it, what's the latest on that? We've been talking about it. I was on a you know a radio show the other day with yeah. Dave King and Dave uh, King, yeah. Um, Doug Duback and Thorpey and we were talking about it but they said they're going to make a decision on July the 1st um, I, hope it is. Um, I know at the moment there's a travel ban uh, yeah. coming this way but if we go that way then we have to have 14 days quarantine I would have to do the 14 days quarantine if uh, <laughs> if it was if it meant racing so let's see hopefully uh, yeah fingers crossed then yeah, I mean, things are opening up, and even in the UK, from what I can see, you know, they, yep. all the practice tracks seem pretty much open, and they said they can start racing from July the 5th, um, 4th, 5th, that weekend, yep. uh, smaller races, so, you know. Uh, yeah, another interesting thing as well, is I went to Fox Hill a couple of weeks ago to do a live video from there, and then I went yesterday and did another one, and they've graded the track right up and everything, so... I'm gathering they would only do that for a reason if they were thinking about running soon. So, yeah, no, I, I, you know, this this has been very unfortunate and very difficult. Mm. Um, it's, mm. it's been very difficult for me because obviously no one could travel over, so yeah. they can't, business is dead. But you know, I know the demand is there. Everyone wants to get going again, and so mm. as soon as we get the travel ban, then I'll be coming over to race over there, and everyone can come over here. All systems go. <laughs> Let's hope for that as soon as possible then. Mm-hmm. Right, Kurt, I really appreciate your time. Been awesome to speak to an idol legend like yourself and myself personally. Unbelievable. Thanks ever so much. No problem at all. Take yeah. it easy, Kurt, and hope to speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kurt.